So I'm very excited and very uh, uh, gratified to have uh, two of the leading people in this new movement, which I call the Social Sustainability Movement. And it's so new that we don't even know what to call it. But the, the key principle, a key idea is not environmental sustainability, per se, in the narrow sense, but the social aspect of sustainability, but actually you can say that social sustainability is prior to environmental sustainability because even if you had great ideas for environmental sustainability, you could not institute them because you don't have a government that's functional. You don't have, a, a, you don't have the nonprofit organizations that are functional to implement these changes. And cities and families and schools are not functioning in a way that is sustainable. Therefore, they could not never implement environmental uh, sustainability. So that's why I, I'm convinced that um, we must work first uh, at this bigger picture, this more holistic concept of sustainability called social sustainability. And the reason I'd like to talk about this is that I uh, put out a book uh, one of the books on this uh, called Healing a Broken World. We have copies back there. Now, there's a little backstory, if I may uh, give, on, the sto on this, uh, how this book came into being and, and who we are up here talking about social sustainability, even though we're not experts and trained in this. This is because the training has come from celestial beings. So this controversial notion that celestial beings can you know, come and, you know, in current contemporary times and teach us new things that are supplemental to the Urantia book well, we've been taught for years, 20 years, and, uh, but it culminate, the culminating teaching, as far as I'm concerned, in regard to society is the movement for social sustainability. The other teaching I think is important, which is, seems to have been subordinated for now, is the movement for world federal government, which I mentioned earlier. And uh, lately, the celestials we ta that I talk to, <laughs> not that I talk to them all the time, but through various channels, uh, have not emphasized global governance. They've not done that. They did it in the Arantia book, but they've taken a step back, in my view, and, and they put that on a back burner because we're not really ready. We don't have enough sustainability in our basic, like, local institutions, let alone a global, sustainable government, right? So th this is a, a complex discussion. But uh, to simplify it, uh, the Celestials once again have come with a teaching that began to um, come through almost 10 years ago. And I, I will admit that when it first came through this particular person, I was uh, not able to work with it. I didn't relate to it. And, um, but over many years, uh, it, it, it was so broad and so deep that... Um, Finally, we converged and put out this book um, that I mentioned, that I just showed you. Um, I'm deeply committed to this. Um, it's just, uh, you know, being 60 years old and seeing so many dysfunctional institutions, beginning with my own family. Uh, <laughs> Don't feel like the Lone Ranger. <laughs> <laughs> and it's what we've all been through. And, and um, so I've always wondered, like, how are we supposed to do all, save this world stuff when we can't even run a committee meeting? Uh, and we don't have the, the, the sort of the, the architecture of uh, a, a social groups that, that, are, that can get it done and don't get everybody just upset. We even had like battles about the video. We had battles about the curtains. And, you know, I was wondering, like, we're not even sustainable to do the conference. <clears throat> we, just, we had this little battle about these curtains and which color that almost led to people walking out of the room. But anyway, that's, that's neither here nor there. But... Uh, uh, so, uh, again, back to the, the point of social sustainability, and what I like especially about this is it gives you these three simple principles, which you think, wow, this is really simple. Equality, we are all egalitarian. Quality of life, quality and equality, when does that come together? Not very often. And uh, what's the third one? Growth. growth, personal growth. Thank you. Yes. Well, you read the book. Way to go. But you need them all three at the same time. So that's what you're going to hear about from our speakers. How do you get all three of these at the same time? Well, you can't really get that in current society because you have elites. The elites have quality of life, right? That's why you want to be elite. You have money, so you have quality of life. You spend your money on quality of life. So they have that, right? But we, there, you can't get equality. You can't get everybody being the elite. You can't get everybody getting quality of life.
You can't get everybody being equal, and you could do that under communism. Maoism, for example. Mao tried to get everybody being equal, but then they destroyed quality of life. They also destroyed the other principle, which is growth, personal growth. Plus, they you know, had to kill off the elites. They had to kill off the elites who had quality of life. They had to get rid of them in order to give equality to everybody else. You see the paradox here? To, uh, to get quality, to equality, had to get rid of the quality people in order to get equality. So the Celestials are looking at this over many eons, really, saying, well, let's look at the humans. They don't, they're a mess because we had a rebellion of the angels, right? So we don't have a visible planetary staff, the core that I showed you, that are not here guiding us. We don't have a capital city. We don't have Adam and Eve, who, by the way, would still be present. Isn't that correct? Adam and Eve would still be present today in a normal planet. We would have visible eight-foot-tall beings called Adam and Eve still here. So we don't have any of this uh, to support us, and we're just making this up as we go. Um, and so they're doing this intervention and teaching these principles to do something that's kind of impossible, getting these three things together at the same time in our institutions, starting with our families, even starting with individuals. So our first uh, speaker, uh, we'll introduce him one at a time. I think you've all have met Liz uh, already. We, she was introduced yesterday. And uh, I was just amazed to, to find out that the woman who I knew is this famous novelist, has evolved into this social change work. And uh, uh, Liz is uh, going to present the first part of, uh, of this presentation. So I'll turn it over to Liz. Thanks, Byron. Interesting that uh, when he first heard about this model of social sustainability, he, it's kind of scared him and... Uh, and uh, he wasn't quite ready for it. When I first found out about it, I thought I was hearing angels sing. So it, um, it's, a, it's an important part of my life and my ministry today. So um, let us begin by thanking the angels and the midwayers and other unseen friends who have been here all weekend, helping us in this Im very important endeavor. Byron, wonderful. Let us also acknowledge the miracle of having a fragment of the living God within each of us and Jesus' spirit of truth, which encircles all of us in this room and binds us together as family. Wherever two or more are gathered, he is with us, and so we welcome the presence of Christ among us today. I have studied the life and teachings of Jesus in the Urantia book and elsewhere for almost 40 years. Even so, when I came upon this systemic fix solution for social sustainability, it was as if a knob had been turned and my life clicked into focus. I began to see very clearly the reality, which up to that time had been merely theory, and it's changed my life. It's changed the way I relate with everyone, including my husband, my family members, my neighbors, and all of you. I have a new vision of my role in life, in the world, in the cosmos, in reality. It began with John 13, 34. I give you a new commandment, that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you should also love one another. In the Urantia book, it's on page 1944. And so I give you this new commandment, that you love one another, even as I have loved you. Just as I have loved you, you also should love one another. Not love your neighbor as yourself, but as I have loved you, as Jesus has loved us, as God has loved us, as the ultimate father loves his errant, stumbling, young, immature, stupid, seeking child who is just trying to please and sometimes get away with stuff. And isn't that who we are? We're fumbling around. We're trying our best, working with the challenges that we've been given. God asks that I love that weird homeless guy on the street corner as if he were my child. God asks that I look at that meth addict 
who robbed us twice with the fierce protective love that parents have for their children. And that's a big order. That trumps all the other commandments. That goes way beyond thou shalt not kill. Well, Jesus was here. This is why I believe I can trust him, because he walked a mile in our moccasins. He knows about us. He knows how we are, prone to pettiness and jealousies, quick to anger and filled with ego and nationalistic and cultural pride. Go Seahawks. (laughs) (gasps) What am I saying here? I didn't say rangers, come on. He knew then that the chances were slim that we would be able to achieve all of this in his absence unless he gave us some help. And so he did. The spirit of truth. The paraclete, the comforter, the helper, the advocate. These are all names for the spirit of truth. Christ's spirit has been with us, in us, for 2,000 years to help us do that very thing which we do best socialize. We are social creatures by design, and we get together under any pretext to socialize. We make a business, we sew a quilt, we raise a barn, we take a class. We get together just to get together in groups of two or more, because when we do, Jesus is there with us, whether we know it or not, whether we acknowledge it or not, whether we engage with him or not, but he is with us and we like that feeling. So we keep doing it. So we begin to make things up for us to do together. Parties, luncheons, businesses, social networks, governments, conglomerates, the more complex, the more interesting. Except that when we build these things, we let our heads get ahead of our hearts. We begin to assemble them out of need, greed, or expediency instead of accessing the wisdom of Christ's spirit to formulate and work together in love as he asked. Today, this is no surprise, some of our most important social systems that have been carefully put into place over the periods of time have failed and many others are teetering toward failure. Some people have too much, while others have nothing. Our kids are taking drugs, getting pregnant in high school, ending up in jail. As many marriages fail as succeed. And so what do we do? We implement more social programs to provide high school daycare centers, drug treatment programs in jail, and cheap no-fault divorces. These are quick fixes. These are not sustainable solutions because we're addressing the symptoms and not the problems. To mask the political failure of social economic systems, many nations are returning to the past habit of starting conflicts to divert the gaze of thoughtful social and economic reformers. Today we think of the current aggression of Russia and China, but the US and Europe are hardly blameless. Middle East combatants claim they fight for God when it's clear that they're in a war over water, oil, and other resources. War. Still. What happened to loving every single person on the planet as Jesus has loved us? How can we privileged Americans buy a winter home in Arizona when children are starving? Would you let your natural birth child starve so you could buy a new boat? Of course not. And yet, we all sip cocktails by the pool while our our spiritual brothers and sisters starve and are brutalized and blown to smithereens, and we call ourselves Christians. For a while, I considered my birth into a middle-income, white, American family and with unlimited potential. I thought that was an accident of birth, but I no longer believe that. I believe that it is precisely that that gave me certain personality propensities so that I might do something with all these opportunities that I've been given. 
all of our systems, all of our systems, from trade to taxation to healthcare to water delivery to food production to the crazy way we force round children into square classrooms is breaking down. And we patch them together, creating enormous bureaucracies that aren't fixing the problems, but are expedient for this legislative term or this administration or this round of funding or for this generation. There's a famous station by the Iroquois Nation that we should never commit a single act without considering its consequences seven generations hence. But who among us considers 200 years in the future when we fill our cars with fossil fuels or throw plastic bags into the garbage? Well, there is a solution. There is a solution. We're not all doomed. And it's been with us all along. We need to bring the spirit of truth to the table and access its wisdom. Jesus knew we'd have a hard time with all of this social stuff, and of course he's right. Here we are. We've never needed him more. It's time to bring the spirit of Christ back into our systems, back into our lives, and back into fashion. There are those who argue that there is no such thing as spirit, that religion is superstition, and there are others who believe that humans will rise above and fix everything with their own creativity and ingenuity, but I see no evidence of that. I think we need to wake up and get about our father's business before that house we have built on sand comes crashing down. This is a haboob. This is a picture of Phoenix. We're all smart. We watch the nightly news. Many people have been sounding the alarm for a long time. The world is awake and aware. I feel a spiritual quickening in the ether, and we're all starting to connect, but we're without direction. We know that something can be done, something must be done, but what? In my research, I was led to Munjoranson and the Correcting Time, and Daniel Raphael's book, Global Sustainability and Planetary Management, The Melchizedek's, have given us a simple formula. It is so simple and elegant, it is beautiful. And I think this is the answer. It's about exchanging our current aggregations of special interests for workable interlocking systems based on the three core values. This simple formula can be worked on any system from the way your family communicates to the way we elect, elect our representatives in Congress. It could be the basis of local budgeting to the way we educate our children. It could change our world from a profit-driven economy to a service-driven economy. It all begins with intention. Intention is the beginning step of any right action. None of us would be here today if it were not for our attention, intention to attend this conference. So intention is the initiating event. The next step is to determine three core spiritual values that serve that intention. What are the core values that run our country? What are the core values that propel our education system? What are the core values that are put into play in our energy policies or our military strategies or our healthcare system? I can't name those core values and I submit that nobody else can either. While we give lip service to this idea, our own federal government does not even operate on the simple principle of the golden rule. Well, this is where we consult the spirit of truth. This is where we bring spiritual values into our systems so we can serve our global family inst instead of only serving CEOs and stockholders. So the core spiritual values start with that divinely inspired document, the Declaration of Independence, whose, life, whose values are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, or in spiritual terms, as Byron said, quality of life, equality, and spiritual growth. Life, because it's the most precious value we're given by our Creator. Equality, because God loves each of us individually and equally. And growth, because that's the natural order of things. The oak tree never becomes an acorn. For every spiritual value that serves the intention, we determine expectations. Precisely, how does growth serve my intention to formulate today's presentation? My three expectations were increased knowledge, greater vision of my role in the cosmos, 
more love in my heart for my spiritual brethren. Now, how do I know if I've achieved these things? The fourth aspect is measurable criteria. These are the concrete, measurable results of the system. They are the proof. Each expectation has measurable criteria by which we know the system is working. Some of my measurable criteria are personal, and some will be defined by your reaction to our presentation here today. Bringing spirit to the table in reformation of social systems actually works. It's flexible enough to be tweaked as need be, as society changes, as new needs arise. If our healthcare system were built on the solid rock of spiritual values, there would never be a discussion of throwing the whole thing out and starting over. Instead, it would be comprised of tiny little interlocking parts, like Legos, each of which could be tweaked or replaced if something wasn't meeting the criteria. These little interlocking parts create a real system, flexible, fluid, elastic, and stable enough to take us 500 years into the future and further. Nobody would be afraid, and isn't that part of the problem? Everyone's in fear. Where is God in that? Today, it's my intention that you will quickly catch on to this very simple process and hold similar small groups in your living rooms. Slowly, as our larger systems fail, and they will fail, these smaller interlocking systems will take their place and begin to undergird our society with common sense procedures based on love and mercy and ministry for the betterment of all mankind. Wherever two or more are gathered, the Spirit of Christ is in attendance, and the power of that fact should never be underestimated. And now I'd like to introduce Jeff Cutler, who is going to direct us an experiential activity of what we've been talking about. Experiential? Um, this is the practicum. Uh, we're going to give you a we're going to give you a handout you can take home so you have some you have a souvenir. Um, I am um, a, a practicing economist. I went to school across the bay in a very uh, non God centered school near the Campanile. Um, I have led my entire professional career on and off Wall Street. I'm what's called a money manager. I've managed mutual funds. I've managed uh, uh, retirement funds for state governments. Most of my clients now that I, I concentrate on are not-for-profits that have a mission statement that I can relate to. Um, I'm on the board. I'm on the board of a hospital system that covers most of Southern Oregon, and I'm the treasurer of the Southern Oregon University Foundation. And I can tell you firsthand Number one, the healthcare system is dysfunctional, at least in Southern Oregon, and the schooling system is dysfunctional, at least in Southern Oregon, and I can tell you all of Oregon higher ed. Um, I want to start by telling you what I believe, so you'll understand my bias. I believe in revelation. When I first started reading the Rancher book, I was torn. I said, this thing is either all fiction, part fiction, part fact, or it's all true. Good God, if it's all true, I'm in trouble. Um, I had a long way to go in my spiritual journey, and I figure I will be perfect, but it's longer than a billion years, <laughs> Byron. Um, so telling you where my bias is is the first thing about being the one of the two, is to be honest with who I'm dealing with. Um, I'm talking about divinely inspired rules for social sustainability, but uh, truthfully, there have been uh, divinely inspired rules for personal behavior for a very long time. Um, until now, uh, these personal rules were about personal conduct only. They weren't about group conduct. Uh, now we've been given a model that, that, that covers personal intentions and group conduct. Uh, I think everybody knows what this is. Uh, the Cathedral of Notre Dame in Paris was started in 18, uh, pardon me, 1183 and finished 162 years later in 1345. Uh, while the gargoyles are somewhat eroded by rainfall, it is still a functioning Catholic church. I've, I've been there. 
um, after 669 years, and there is no reason to expect that it will not remain there for another thousand. So the question here, and the purpose of this slide, is to say, what were the thoughts and motivations of those who volunteered their time and their treasure, knowing that the project would, would not even be completed for another seven generations? What were their commitments and what were their intentions? I'd like, to, like you to hold that thought for a second. Um, the oldest known um, divinely inspired uh, model for personal behavior is in the Arantia book. It's on page 870. And there are seven commandments. I'll just read them to you in case for the people who are new readers or have not read the book. Thou shalt not serve any God but the most high creator of the heaven and earth. You shall not doubt that faith is the only requirement for eternal salvation. You shall not bear fair false witness, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not show disrespect for your parents and elders. Um, I'm guilty of several of those, I won't mention which ones. <laughs> um, the, the, the second well-known divine conduct of rules was the Ten Commandments. And... Um, Oh, uh, that Cecil B. DeMille. I'm not sure that he was divinely inspired, but Moses was. Um, the most widely known um, model for uh, personal behavior is the Golden Rule. Every major religious group has, a, has some sense of do no harm to others. Uh, at the end, Liz is going to give you a copy of this slide. It just cannot possibly be a coincidence that the golden rule or something very close to it is in every religious faith on the planet. Um, I believe that there have been recent revelations in the 20th century. Uh, there were several, at least in my personal opinion. Um, it was a man by the name of Herbert J. Taylor, and in 1932 he was the he was the uh, uh, chairman of a failing corporation, and he noticed that um, uh, the, the corporate advertising was false, the product was not good, and he called in uh, four people uh, from his firm and said, what can we do to fix this? What do you think is right? Uh, one was Jewish, one was uh, Catholic, uh, I, I believe that he was an Episcopalian, and I don't remember the fourth. I think it might have been an Indian fellow. Um, and he came up with, as a, as a result of his prayer uh, to God, saying, what can I do here? He was a Rotarian, and he, and he came up with the four-way test. Is it the truth? Is it fair to all concerned? Will it build goodwill and better friendships? Is it beneficial to all concerned? Um, I have traveled more widely than most Americans, um, some for diplomatic reasons and some for business reasons. And I will tell you it is my personal opinion that Rotary International is the most respected American institution. Not our military, not our foreign policy, it is Rotary. Uh, the four-way test is taught to literally billions of small ch school children, particularly in third world countries. Um, I believe that Alcoholics Anonymous, I believe that Course in Miracles, are also um, revelations. The first addition, I think, to the revelations of the 21st century is this um, values-based model. Um, what's different about this than prior revelations about personal behavior? Well, um, it's transitional. It's transformational. It moves personal morality from me to us. All the previous rules are nouns. All right. This model is a verb. It, it denotes action. It denotes motion. A rule is, it's not a rule where if you break it, you'll be punished or scorned. Uh, it's a tool to be used to solve complex problems that, can, that involve more than one person's personal behavior. Okay? Nouns do not change, verbs are in motion. 
This model is social as it involves several individuals. This model is collaborative and requires purpose, direction, and focus. This model requires teamwork to be successful. This model is co-creative and can absorb intuition, spiritual guidance, and each team member's inspiration. Um, Phil Cal Calabrese had to go to San Diego, but um, I don't know how many of you know about Benoit Mandelbrot. A couple, good. Math majors, huh? Um, he, he, he was a very interesting fellow. He was a, he was a Polish uh, fellow who, along with every other Polish um, male older than 16, was put in a prison camp af right after September 1939. His father was a, uh, a mathematician at, at Co Nicholas Copernicus University, and his uncle was a very famous mathematician. And when he was hauled off, uh, it wasn't to Auschwitz, I can't remember, it was another one, another camp where they put intern poles. His uncle said, there's an ancient mathematical puzzle that's never been solved. And if you can solve it, your career will be made forever. And that mathematical puzzle was to determine the length of shoreline on an irregular shaped island. And after four years in a prison camp, he solved it. Um, this, this page shows um, four Mandelbrot uh, creations that are mathematical and two pictures. Um, so at the top left is a picture of Benoit. Next to him, the mathematical solution to his, his uncle's challenge. Uh, and they're actually called bays and islands and inlets. That's, this is a mathematical formula. Um, the formula itself, z goes into z squared plus a constant, where the constant has to be greater than 1, or the island will start getting smaller. Okay, so why am I showing you this? The, these, this page shows us four pictures of Mandelbrot's and two sets of photographs. Okay, he discovered that nature produces, nature produces exquisitely complicated designs by using simple rules that can be repeated or sustained without end. The rule of these fractals, he called them z goes into z squared plus a constant. All fractals have a mathematical formula. Uh, the photograph at the bottom right is the trunk of an elephant. It's not a fractal. Um, his most famous example of this was not the island, which was his real masterpiece, but his trying to make it an audience for perhaps a TED Talk. He gave a TED Talk, one of the originals. Uh, it was a cauliflower. Okay. Uh, what he noticed after he had solved the problem of the island uh, was that the same fractal design he had, he had discovered there was true of each floret on the cauliflower. So... Each small floret had the exact same design as the whole flower, no, ma no matter how large the flower became. So here's our practicum. Uh, we live in an unstable world, which in my opinion will change drastically in my lifetime. And I'm almost 70. I'll be 70 in December. It's going to happen in my lifetime. I'm an economist. I've predicted with, with an awful lot of money. Um, we have been sent a model or a prism with which to view problems with intention towards solution. And this model is useful now as a plan in the drawer when all else around us has failed. I have studied history at great length. Every great society has collapsed at the fault of government. No nation, no civilization has ever been defeated they have all committed suicide. Okay, how to solve a problem of sustainability? Well, the same way to eat an elephant, one bite at a time. So please notice here that we use the word solve rather than the word fix. These are two distinct concepts. Efforts to, endless efforts to fix the problems as such as poverty, unwanted, unloved children, and the myriad 
of related social issues is an obvious failure because the the three self-evident values, well, we can all remember them now, right? Life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, or the the 21st century uh, equivalent, is ignored or missing entirely. In complex systems, and particularly in complex social systems, fixes are doomed. Uh, Byron has chosen a, a sample problem for us to analyze through this model. Oops, I gotta. Let's go to the model. Um, and so, Liz, would you start? What we need to do to salt, to it, get you in the idea here is, I want you to uh, stand up and get in groups of five, just chairs of fives. Just take a minute. Get five people together. Okay, now Liz is handing out little packets, and they're, they're, they are they say, hi, my name is? Okay, she's going to hand out a packet to each group of five. 